So now to our guest, Frank Sherry from the United States. Frank is the founder of America's Voice, uh, a communications strategy war room, as he calls it, for pro-immigration policy reform. He didn't start off in this way. He started off as one of America's best known pro-immigration advocates. But, but I don't, lest you think that he's just another communications consultant, one of the things uh, that's important to know is that he has breathed immigration and uh, refugee issues for a lifetime. Ever since he, I think he graduated from Princeton, he then worked with helping uh, refugees from Vietnam and Indonesia make their way to the United States. He got involved with uh, U.S. Uh, immigration policy, and if, if I'm successful, he'd tell us some war stories from his time working with Senators McCain and Kennedy and Presidents Clinton and Bush and all of that. Um, he came to communications as, as a very important move, I think, in his advocacy life, understanding that without speaking to the hearts and minds uh, of the American people and their represented representatives, any advocacy movement was doomed to failure. So he's converted himself into a messaging guru. Um, he speaks uh, a great deal about speaking not to the usual suspects, but to the, to the unconverted, um, and so through them uh, to the American people. As a result, he's one of the most noted commentators uh, in the US, television, radio, etc., on pro-immigration matters. Frank has in the process become a very well-known trainer, communications trainer, both in the US and Europe, and we're very fortunate to have brought him here for two days to work with some of our stakeholders. Some of you are in the room and others not. Um, we feel that we have much to learn from him and others like him because we too are, are facing uh, difficult and possibly more challenging times around immigration issues. But getting back to Frank, it seems that people are not quite sure what to make of Frank. As he himself says, he is a white guy, or what does he say? The white guy in the suit, and he looks every bit the Washingtonian insider. And the question often gets asked, why does Frank do this? What compels Frank? So let me start off with that question. Imperialistic egomania? Yeah, that's, yeah. I am an American. I have yeah. to <laughs> pander to the crowd. Um, gosh, why do I do this? I, uh, well, so many of you in the room are involved in this kind of work. I don't know. I just think it's the best thing going. The idea of people leaving uh, situations that are unsustainable, lack of security, lack of opportunity, personal lifestyle, families in, in, in harm's way politically due to their faith, lack of opportunity, moving to a country where they are accepted legally but then have to be accepted socially, economically, and culturally. The strength and the courage that refugees and migrants bring, you know, the, the Statue of Liberty in New York's harbor says, bring me your tired and your poor. I've never seen tired and poor people pick up and move halfway around the globe. <laughs> it's the strong and the courageous who are moving. And that's such a tremendous strength and asset to countries. And then <clears throat> Canada's very different in this regard from America. The official welcome in the United States has gotten very, very negative, hostile, uh, dehumanizing. And to see a country that I love, my country, treat strong and courageous people who have risked everything to get there. And I, you know, I, I first got into this work, Ratna, because I wanted to be a do-gooder. I, I got rid of that notion pretty quickly, actually. But I now do it because I actually think that I am a patriot, that I'm helping America become what it has been at its best in the past, what it will be, I hope, again in the future, and it's by it's, it's, the debate seems to be about are immigrants and refugees good enough for America? The question is, is America going to embrace the opportunity that refugees and immigrants bring in a way where we live truer to our ideals and to who we say we are? So I, um, uh, to me, it's a calling and a cause that I uh, love 
uh, uh, the people that are involved in this are so inspiring. And um, uh, I just, you know, I just hope I live long enough to see a breakthrough in the United States. <laughs> I thought it would happen by now, but apparently not. Let's talk about that a little and go back to your first few, many, first many years when I first got to know you, you were an advocate. Right. Um, and you worked on, camp on reform campaigns of one kind or another. And I know that in 2001 and 2007, you, be you came tantalizingly close to the smell of success. Yeah, you know, the, the issue in the United States, I think most of you know, is that almost a third of the immigrants in the United States are in the United States illegally, without papers. We call them undocumented immigrants, our opponents call them illegals. And um, that population is 11 million people, the size of the state of Ohio. And so, what do you do about that? And we came up with an approach, it first developed when President George W. Bush, not my kind of president, I assure you, but on immigration, being from Texas and speaking some Spanish and having been involved in Major League Baseball, he had a real affinity for Latin American immigrants and for immigration reform. It was one of the few issues where he had a progressive instinct. And Vicente Fox was the democratically elected president in Mexico, and we were involved in a binational commission, some of us, and we said, you know what? Here's an opportunity for two kind of conservatives to get immigration right. So we presented this idea of a bilateral U.S.-Mexico migration, and the idea was legalize the flow of migration in an orderly fashion, so people didn't have to come with smugglers and with no rights, but with visas and with rights, including the right to permanently settle in the United States, not just live temporarily. Legalize the, at that point, I think it was five or six million undocumented immigrants in the United States, at the same time that you cooperate to make it a modern regulatory regime that delivers the orderliness that the American people insisted on. So we thought this was a great idea. It's now called comprehensive immigration reform. And we got very close. Bush and Fox, well, should I, I'll, I'll just tell you what happened was, heady days, Bush and Fox were really serious about this. They were going to negotiate a bilateral agreement and try to get it through both of their Congresses. Fox was in the United States on a state visit the first week of September in 2001. And we were doing all the work behind the scenes, and finally we got word that Bush and Fox had shaken hands and said, all right, we're gonna get a deal done. We're gonna get an accord signed ready, and ready for our Congress by December. And on September 10th, 2001, I was called into the White House with a small group of advocates and it was like that moment in the film with Robert Redford, what's the candidate, yeah. where like, he wins and the campaign manager comes in and he goes, what do we do now? So the same White House staff that had been saying, no, no, we're not gonna do this, and we had been pressing hard, their boss had just shaken hands with Fox and said, let's get a deal done. And so they literally, we came in, about 10 of us, and they said, what do we do? How do we get from here to December in a way that gets this controversial deal done? And I remember walking out of that meeting going, I can't, first of all, I can't believe I'm in the White House when George Bush is president. <laughs> that, that they invited me at all is kind of a miracle. And secondly, that we have an opportunity to make history in the next three or four months. And I was on the phone the next morning with the White House as I was driving from Virginia to DC, and my route takes me by the Pentagon, and the plume of smoke came over the tree line from the attack on the Pentagon, and my friend in the White House was saying, oh my god, a second plane just hit the World Trade Center. And we knew right then that chances for that breakthrough and making history were done. Fast forward to 2007, Ted Kennedy, John McCain, partnered George W. Bush again, the last great fight of his presidency, but he had such depleted capital because of Iraq and uh, all, uh, Katrina and so many issues. But they fought hard for reform. It was one of these backroom deals <laughs> that would have legalized 12 million people. And it was opposed by most on the left, and it was vigorously opposed by most on the right. And uh, I was one of those advocates who, what do they say, what, the only thing in the middle of the road is a dead skunks and white lines? Uh, I was like that. We were the advocates who were for it, mainly because Kennedy was our hero and he asked us to back him up on this. 
uh, but the deal was just bad enough, the backroom deal that they cut was just bad enough that all the constituency groups that were for reform didn't like it. So there was no energy for it. Meanwhile, the right wing went ballistic. And it was really a forerunner to the Tea Party. They had, they used social media, uh, email lists, they had activists mobilized, and they bombarded Congress. They shut down the Senate uh, phone system on the last day of the vote, and we fell short. And it was a devastating defeat. Um, and uh, that was probably the bleakest professional day of my career, but uh, it was more bleak for the 12 million undocumented immigrants who were, have since faced ramped up enforcement that literally is like living under siege and has continued under President Obama. Um, and so uh, we, we've, we've, we thought we'd have a chance with President Obama, other priorities, health care, again, depleted his political capital. Uh, we had a fight over the DREAM Act, but really we're now looking at a bleak situation where a breakthrough that would help legalize the 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States may well be five, 10 years off, and that may be optimistic. So we've come close a couple of times, fallen short. We've had to retool. We keep retooling, trying to get better. But I have to say, um, what I once thought of as a policy issue that with a good idea and the right combination of legislators on our side now has the much more of a feel of a kind of a civil rights movement. We, we often look in the United States to the LGBT community, the gay and lesbian community, because they've gotten so well organized and have had such an impact on public opinion that they're actually winning um, the big policy fights. And we aspire to be that kind of movement. We're getting there, but obviously we're not strong enough yet. So from, from an advocate to a communication strategy, describe what happened and, and why did you decide <laughs> to shift gears to this extent and do what you do, which is create, and create America's voice? Yeah. You know, I have just have to say, being in Canada a couple of days and, and, and sensing the public opinion climate on these issues, it's like paradise to me. <laughs> I can smell the welcome. I can feel the freedom. I've, I may pl apply for asylum by the end of the week. <laughs> it's a remarkable thing. Um, and you, you follow, Amer you, you all know America pretty well. You have to watch some of our news programs and see the combative debate. We first, you know, I was like a Washington advocate guy, and I thought all you have to do is convince legislators to do the right thing, and that's enough. And we learned the hard way, you know this story, Ratna, when I was, tell it, tell it again. Um, in 1993, the first World Trade Center attack, remember when four people died, set off a, 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 a truck bomb in the basement, um, that was organized by a terrorist cell in which some of the members were failed asylum seekers. They had come into the airport, asked for asylum, didn't show up at their hearing, and proceeded to plan the attack. Oh, the media went ballistic. And our opponents were ready for the moment. You know 60 Minutes, that show? There was a sh show where my opponent, Dan Stein, was on that show, and he just had all the right sound bites, and, and it exploded. Tom Brokaw of NBC decided to do a special live show on, him, on this attack invited me and Dan Stein, you know, I was the, the other white guy in Washington with a suit who talked about these issues. So I realized later, when we had this interview with Tom Brokaw, Dan Stein, my opponent, they had done public opinion research, they had had media coaches, he had done planning, they had done prep work for this particular appearance. You know, and I showed up saying, well, I'm gonna shoot from the hip. <laughs> I'm gonna speak truth to power. I don't know if it was more arrogant or naive, but it was one of those two. Anyway, Tom Brokaw starts the interview, says to Dan Stein, so what's the problem with this, our asylum program? He says, all you have to do is come to JFK Airport, say the magic words political asylum, and you can come in and kill Americans. We have to restrict asylum to save American lives. And I was sitting there watching him going, whoa, <laughs> that was pretty intense. Brokaw turns, I, think he's gonna, I thought he was going to ask me the same question. No, he goes, Mr. Sherry, doesn't the World Trade Center bombing mean that it's harder to advocate for generous, immigration, generous asylum policies in America? Um, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> Needless to say, it got worse from there, by the way, an hour-long show. 
okay? And it was after that that our key funders and our leaders, we sat down and, you know, I owned it. I said, man, we're, we're in big trouble. Because the political space was closing down, right? It wasn't a matter of if they were going to change the asylum policies. It was whether they were going to gut it entirely. And it wasn't just asylum. It was a, there was an attempt to have a zero, an American version of zero immigration. Huh. You know, cut legal immigration by three quarters, restrict asylum, cap refugee from overseas. I mean, it was a bit, and we were, we, we were supposed to be advocating. Our friends in Congress were saying, Did you see, do you see what's on the press? We can't go to a town hall meeting without our constituents yelling and screaming at us. You're going to have to give us something. So that's when we started to realize that if we can't influence the media narrative on these issues, we can't win the policy we want. So that was our first lesson. And in 2007, when we suffered that bitter defeat, again, our opponents were better prepared. We had pretty good messages, but they had the, the capacity to generate so much heat. They also have an infrastructure in Fox News and talk radio that the left just doesn't have in America. We're, it's cultivating more of an infrastructure through ethnic media and progressive blogosphere, but that's been more recent, quite frankly. So we got our hats handed to us in 2007, and we sat down as leaders and we said, why did we lose? And it was, we weren't powerful enough, and we weren't persuasive enough. In terms of power, we've invested heavily in voter mobilization of immigrant voters so that both parties get scared of them. That's our goal. And we invested in a new organization, America's Voice, so that we could be the war room. So we have a staff of you know, 15 equivalents working full time on trying to influence media coverage on immigration. And we operate with a you know, v volume and velocity. We're tough, we're edgy, we're in their face. We're in social media, we're on, in the blogosphere, we're in ethnic media, we're battling with the political press in Washington, and we're finally getting competitive. And our movement's getting more competitive. Why? Because the media narrative defines the political space for policy. And we have to compete for that space in order to have a shot at either winning on defense or winning on offense. So which is the audience that you target? Are you targeting? The people who are, you know, who listen to Fox News, the Glenn Becks of the world, uh, or are you targeting the soft middle, or are you working with the converted? What's your goal there? Yeah, that's a excellent question because we've done, we've tried all of those things, and we've had huge fights within our movement, within our community of advocates about what to prioritize. Should we? really mobilize our support to build strength? Should we speak and connect with the frustrations of the movable middle and focus on that? And what should we do about our opponents who are very well organized and very hard line and not in the mood to negotiate? We used to have huge fights, because I was one of those guys who said, if we don't win the argument in the middle, we don't have a chance to win. But it really angered a lot of grassroots activists who thought, yeah, but we're missing out on an opportunity to speak about the pain that's being experienced in immigrant communities and the power that can be mobilized there. And it took me a long time to realize that they were right. It also took them a long time to realize that I was right, that we also had to speak to the movable middle, to people who were frustrated, who didn't relate to this as a civil rights or social justice issue, who saw this as a problem that government should solve, and why the hell don't they? So we finally, in the last two years, have adopted a, uh, a, a three-pronged approach on our communications. And there's tensions between these three prongs, but we have a vocabulary that we can use to manage the tensions. So one, we talk about mobilizing and expanding our base as a legitimate objective, but should be done intentionally and strategically when it matters. So when we were trying to get Barack Obama to make immigration reform a priority, we weren't trying to speak to the movable middle. We had a rally on the Washington Mall that drew 250,000 people. We knew that 250,000 immigrants on the mall in Washington would scare the bejesus out of a whole lot of swing voters, white swing voters. But, we, but our priority was to mobilize support to put pressure on Obama. We were willing to take the chance. On the other hand, when we're fighting the battle in some of these southern states and western states over Arizona copycat laws, I mean, if we're only speaking to the base, we are missing the opportunity to win. So 
we speak to the middle and we say, we understand the frustration with illegal immigration. We should restore the rule of law to our system. Um, there are ways to do this in a way that will end illegal immigration. And, 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 and try to connect with their concerns without sacrificing what our policy outcome is. So we, so we either are either expanding the base, persuading skeptics, and then what to do about our opponents. Well, for most of the last 20 years, they've spent their time trying to marginalize us, and we were really goody two-shoes and didn't think that was appropriate. Now we've changed our mind. Um, you know, we operate the way a political campaign does. You want to mobilize your core support, you want to win swing voters, and yeah, you want to define your opposition. So we do more of that, and it's not for everyone. That's why we're an independent organization. A lot of our partners are like, I'm glad you're doing it, but don't implicate me. <laughs> because we call out our opponents for their extremism, for their extreme proposals. I mean, we think it's pretty radical that the position of the anti-immigrant groups and the many Republicans who support them, that the position of what to do with 11 million people, most of whom have been in the United States for longer than a decade, most of whom live in families, is that they should be expelled. That's the official position. That is radical to me. I mean, that's, to me, kind of a cleaned up version of ethnic cleansing. And so we say that now with um, a great deal of assertiveness. It really bothers our opponents, and I suppose that's a sign of success. Um, but, so those are our three goals. Expand the base, move the middle, define our opponents, and we're at least, we have our vocabulary and an intentionality about what we're doing when we're doing it. We still have to get a lot better at it, but, um, this is a far cry from the days of the grassroots versus the national groups arguing over message in a fractious display of disunity. So it seems to me that in your context, at least, at least it's, and, and to some extent it's, it's creeping here, not just from the United States, but just our context, that it's a question, it's an issue of us versus them. So describe to us what you've done, what we can do about creating uh, an environment where it's about all of us instead of us versus them? Yeah, gosh, that's another great question. Yeah, I mean, my basic analysis is that there's two strains in this debate. It's not this side versus that side, it's this view versus that view. This view is our turf, our resources, who the heck do you think you are coming to take ours? Now, that, is, that tribalistic appeal is very powerful. Since the dawn of humankind, it's worked. And so the idea that we should accept the newcomers as us is a pretty radical and enlightened idea. But that's our, that's our challenge, is to make that case. I think Canada and the United States and other New World countries have a better case to make, have a better founding. When we go to Europe, there's not a lot of, boy, we're a country founded by immigrants. Right? Um, it's just the opposite. Right? Germany still says we're not a country of immigrants, even though 15% of the country is immigrant. So that, that identity gives us a chance to say, wait a minute, who we are is not just the us already here. The us is a flexible notion, an open notion, that where when the thems become the us, the us becomes stronger. In America, it's the motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one. Um, you know, Canada has its versions uh, of this, and um, it really is what makes, I mean, it's, it's not, this, I'm not just looking for a message. To me, that's what motivates me, is the fact that America, when it has included rather than excluded, has become a much better place. Think women, think African Americans, think gay and lesbians, think immigrants. In the last hundred years, those great battles have been for the soul of America. And I think our generation is engaged in a great battle over whether immigrants are gonna be us's or them's. And it will determine whether America once again reaches for its best ideals or becomes a declining ex-empire who stopped being true to what made it uh, an interesting and dynamic place in the first place. I was on your website today, Frank, and I, I noticed with interest some of the unusual allies you seem to have 
drawn to, to your message, the pastor in, in some evangelical church, the, pol the, the police chief in Mormon, Utah. Can you comment on those, uh, those strategies using unusual allies? Sure. Or, or yeah, uh, we have found that um, one of the most effective ways to break through is to recruit unusual spokespeople to say what we might say. Um, so currently, uh, we're, we've been working very hard with conservative Christian evangelicals in the United States who are starting to see this as a moral issue, an issue of faith. They're also starting to realize that in the evangelical church, the largest growth, component of growth are immigrants who are joining the church, and so you have you know, 70% of, I heard this the other day, 70% of the Pentecostal Hispanic ministers are undocumented themselves. <laughs> so when they go to their conclaves with their white brothers, it's an interesting discussion. <laughs> Very interesting discussion. And they've challenged, and, and, and remarkably, conservative Christian white leaders are beginning to stand up and take lots of heat for it. You know, we first discovered the power of an unusual messenger when we first started to make communications more of a priority back in the early 90s, we were, um, if you remember California passed this ballot measure called Proposition 187. It was an anti-immigrant measure designed to eliminate all services for undocumented immigrants, including kicking kids out of school, something that's unconstitutional, but they wanted to provoke a Supreme Court challenge. And they were, it, it, so it was ca caught up in the courts, but the Republicans had taken over Congress in 94 and 95, and they were going for it. And they wanted to authorize states to kick undocumented kids out of public schools. And it was going to pass the House of Representatives overwhelmingly. And the only question was whether we could somehow get a Republican Senate against it. And so we sat down at an advocacy meeting and we were talking about it. And of course, there's all the sort of lefty activists saying, what do we do? And I was like, we have to stand up for the children. <laughs> That's going to be our main argument. And I just sat there and I said, you know, these Republicans who are voting for this, they don't give a hoot about, these, these aren't their children, these are somebody else's children that they don't like. So I just don't think it's gonna work. And they said, well, what do we do? And we were racking our brains. And we finally came up with an idea and we executed it. And this is what it looked like when we first did it. We talked to some friends in the union movement who got a guy from the Fraternal Order of Police. I don't know if this was oh, Hanahan or Callahan or whatever his name was, but he was a guy from Baltimore and he had his blue uniform on, thank God. Buttons bursting. And he read the statement that we prepared for him. And the press just showed up at this press conference. Police to talk about immigration issues. What? Unheard of. They all came and this guy stood and he goes, those stupid members of Congress they want to take kids who are in school and put them on street corners? We spend every day trying to get kids off of street corners because you know what happens to kids on street corners? They either make trouble or they get, in, they get victimized by troublemakers. We want kids in school so they stay out of trouble and these stupid members of Congress are going to make the job of the cop on the beat so difficult, it's unbelievable, right? Oh, front page story, New York Times. Right? I don't know how this guy got authorization to do it. I don't know how our union friends, I mean, but it just caught fire. And within three months, every police chief, major police chief in the country had come out against this bill. <laughs> and the Republicans were all like, this, we can't be for, against the cops. <laughs> and so then they all started fighting each other. Then I knew we were winning when the proponents brought out a, a, a front law enforcement group to say they were actually for it. I thought, if the only debate is whether cops are for it or against it, we're good, and we defeated it. So that was the, that's the power of an unusual messenger. That's why we worked with George W. Bush. It's why we worked with John McCain. Um, and it's why it's frustrating now that there's no Republicans who really, they're so afraid of that Tea Party wing that they'll be challenged in a primary that they're not willing to stand up for immigration reform. And so, as a result, we may just have to maximize our political power until they sue for peace. So Frank, one of the things you know we're interested here in, in Canada and here in Maitri specifically is the power of cities to showcase integration success. 
And, and the fascinating thing about the United States is, on the one hand, the divisive nature of your public discourse on this issue. But at the same time, you know, you have Arizona and you have the Minutemen, and then you have Mayor Bloomberg and his coalition of US mayors banding together and putting out statements on pro-immigration policy reform because it's good for the economy, because it's good for their cities. How does all this play out in the American public? I mean, do you think there is a chance of success that the grassroots movement of city mayors will have an impact on the national narrative? Yeah, I do, and I, I, I think Maitri is really visionary in the Cities on Migration project that's looking at cities. It's, it's, it's changed my thinking, because we've been thinking nationally, legislatively, and as a result, we have to win a lot of votes from people who don't come from areas with lots of immigrants. But where we're strongest, politically, culturally, economically, socially, is in the cities. I mean, New York City almost has as high a percentage of immigrants as Toronto. And the fact is, is that Bloomberg is a great spokesman for it. Because in the debate, as it's gotten more politically polarized, the kind of space for this is good for the economy and any smart businessman worth his salt knows that, or businesswoman knows that. It had been left vacant. Businesses had gotten scared, intimidated by the Tea Party, other priorities. They had to fight health care reform, after all. Um, sorry, that was a little dig. Um, <laughs> and, and so Bloomberg has stepped in. You know who his partner is in this campaign? I don't know if it's gotten a lot of press here. Rupert Murdoch, the owner of Fox News. And um, it's remarkable. And he's recruited CEOs across the country. And I think we've just seen the beginning. I think Bloomberg is going to become the national spokesperson for immigration reform starting this year. He's already a big time player. And it's had its effect. So what's happened is that with Washington stuck, our politics broken and immigration reform not moving, you even have an example from the state of Utah. I don't know if you followed this, but you know, once the Arizona immigration law, the anti-immigrant law passed last year, and Republicans won so many of the state legislatures in the last election, they said, mm, yummy, we're going to pass Arizona-like laws all through uh, the country, 24 states have taken up Arizona-like laws. It hasn't passed in one. It'll pass in a few southern states. Hmm. Um, but uh, it hasn't passed in any. Utah got scared. The business community, the police chief from Salt Lake City, a libertarian think tank, the LDS church, the Mormon church, banded together and said, you know what? We cannot have what happened to Arizona happen to Utah. We don't want cancellation of tourism. We don't want a black mark on our uh, uh, reputation. We don't want to have uh, workers being scared away from the state. So they passed a law that would grant work trying to grant work permits to the undocumented living in the state. A state legalization program from one of the most conservative states in the union. Now, it's probably unconstitutional just in the way the Arizona law is unconstitutional, because under our Constitution, the Supreme Court says the federal government's supreme. But it is such a challenge, saying, well, if you're not going to do it, we're going to do it. And we're not going to be like those dunderheads in Arizona. We're going to do something that's actually kind of progressive and surprising. And so now other states are starting to look at it. I don't think it will become a movement where there will actually be state pilot programs, even though I would love for that to happen. But I do think it's going to be a real challenge to the legislators in these states to do more than just say, you know, we, don't, we have nothing to say about this, or secure the border first, or the other inanities that they say. So I'm very excited about the bottom-up stuff from, from cities and from states, and I think it will transform the debate over time. Okay, thanks. Let's shift our attention a little bit to Canada. You know we're in a federal election. We talked about it last night. Uh, and we find ourselves in a very interesting position that every political party which wants to get a majority is now wooing the minority vote. Uh, so it is a, a terrific opportunity, and there's also a challenge here. How do we ma best make use of this opportunity in the few weeks leading up to the election? But more importantly, how do we hold politicians' feet to the fire so that they deliver on the promises that they make? Yeah. We haven't worked that part out in the States. Yeah, I just have to say, um, I'm trying to figure out how to have Jason Kenney and Stephen Harper come down and talk to Republicans in the United States. <laughs> you can have them. <laughs> I, 
and this is for the record, I love that they're pandering, okay? I love it. <laughs> That's a sign of success to me. Um, not that I necessarily think that they'll keep their promises, but you know, six million for a loan program, that's, that's doable. Um, anyway, it's so different now than the Republican Party has run away from immigrants, and you see the conservative party kind of running to immigrants, at least that's what it looks like to, to an outsider. Um, so I, I think it's a sign of success. I mean, you know, the leaders uh, um, uh, of so many communities here in the room, they, they, you know how to take advantage of this. You, you, you use your access, you ask for commitments, you challenge them about whether they're gonna keep them and you establish a relationship and you work like heck to try to keep them, to hold them to account. You know, we had Barack Obama promise us quite famously. You know, remember John McCain was a big hero in immigration reform. And so Barack Obama it was like, there was some question, should we really unofficially tie our fate to Obama. And he went around the country to all the major conventions of Latino and Asian and ethnic communities and gave brilliant speeches about the need for immigration reform and how what was happening now was intolerable and how he was gonna make it a priority in his first year. And it electrified uh, immigrant voters, particularly Latino voters, but also Asian voters. Um, and uh, the, bigger, the biggest blocks, if you will, not that they're blocks, but the biggest communities, so therefore the size and influence is more noticeable and more pandered to. Um, and quite frankly, the big question now, given that Obama hasn't kept his promise and has kept those s s serious enforcement uh, measures in place, actually expanded them, is there's now a debate starting, in, particularly in the Latino community, Latino immigrant community, should we turn out for them? What they're saying is Republicans hate us and Democrats take us for granted. So should we keep rewarding the party that's taking us for granted or do we have to say, you know, we're, we're not gonna just show up every time. So I think that we're at the beginning of all this, right? I mean, uh, in the States, the sort of new immigrant political power is just shown up in the last three election cycles, the last six years. And with the new census figures that just came out, you can just see and the politicians, oh, this was my favorite week in Washington, was when the new census figures came out and it said that one out of six people in the country is Latino and we're gonna be a majority minority nation in, you know, I don't know, 2041. And the politicians were like, oh my God. Because they've been pandering to those white voters thinking that whoever wins the white voters wins, right? Democrats taking minority voters, visible minority voters for granted and Republicans blowing the dog whistle of demagoguery to mobilize their base against the visible ethnic minorities. That's, that's the state of American politics. That will have to shift if the Republicans are ever gonna take the White House and if the Republican Party, uh, and if the Democrats are gonna actually take advantage of the opportunity they have. So I think we're in a long-term struggle. What we've I don't do the, the voter mobilization work, but I'm fascinated by it. We do some of the advertising associated with it. But the people who do the boots on the ground, the, the door knocking, what they say is it takes three election cycles to be really good in a, in a city. Mm. Now in Los Angeles, after the Proposition 187, the community groups and labor unions got together and transformed that Republican-leaning state into a Democratic lock state with immigrant votes. Just changed it. And now the project is to do that nationwide. So Nevada, Harry Reid, Senate Majority Leader, was given up for dead. His opponent was demagoguing Latino immigrants. Harry Reid said he was gonna fight for immigrants. All the political pundits were saying, why is he committing political suicide? And he won in a remarkable come from behind victory because of the turnout of immigrant voters. And the people on the ground were really well organized. Not in Arizona, where they were demagoguing immigrants, but there hadn't been the investment in that infrastructure. So we're spending a lot of time talking to funders and talking to each other about how do we have a more long-term strategy of investing in citizenship drives, voter registration drives, and turn out the vote drives, so that, the, and, and, and not necessarily say vote for this party, vote, so that no matter what, the parties have to respect you. And I do think it's gonna take probably three or four more election cycles before it bears fruit with major breakthroughs in policy. One of the challenges, Frank, is that as a result of all this attention, people start resenting the folks who are getting the attention. So today, 
uh, there was an article in our press uh, that Chief Clarence Louis, who was, by the way, one of the most influential Aboriginal leaders in Canada, said that before Canada looks to bringing in immigrant labor to meet X, Y, and Z shortage, they should look to the talent that is present available in the Native community. So it sort of sets us up in a way. It's a difficult question for us because many of us in the social justice community actually believe right. that in fact uh, we must work uh, better with Aboriginal community uh, uh, youth in particular so that they are able to take their rightful place in society. So we're sort of caught in the crosshair in this. Uh, what advice do you give us? Yeah, we, we have a similar situation in that um, some African American leaders say, why are we helping immigrants when there's so many unemployed young African Americans? And um, for a long time, we stayed in our silo and said, let's just ignore it. Boy, was that a stupid strategy. What we've done now is engage the leadership in the African American community and come up with a joint agenda. So again, think of it from a sort of a communications point of view, whenever I hear either or, I'm, I've now trained myself to say, wait a minute, we have to get to both and. Okay. So it's not do this or do this, it's do this and do that. And so we've actually developed a joint agenda of how to protect the labor rights of immigrant workers, how to help African Americans, and a joint, a joint strategy so that we stand shoulder to shoulder rather than face to face. And it's made a big difference. So we've closed ranks with most in the African American community, the labor union movement, um, and, and many progressives in a way where we're not the outlier saying, bring in the immigrants and forget everybody else. It's let's bring in the immigrants as part of a national development strategy that includes all. It's hard. This stuff ain't easy. I mean, our relationship with the labor movement, particularly some of the dinosaurs in the labor movement, has been really fractious. Um, and you know, some of the white do dominated trades are, you know, yeah. they're, they're watching Glenn Beck and saying stuff that isn't pretty, but their leadership gets it and they're, they're making a tremendous effort to get the union movement on the right side because they also see that workers are workers and when immigrants are played off against natives, it hurts all workers and that immigrant workers are the future of the labor movement. So we're making some progress, but that stuff, that's just, man, get your hands dirty have tough conversations and stay with it. That's what we're doing. We're almost at the end of our, our, our time before we take questions on the cue cards, but I want to shift to asylum seekers. We certainly do not have uh, the same scale of, of, uh, of, the, of the issue that you have, uh, but we go ballistic when 450 people arrive in a boat off the coast of British Columbia. Um, and, and asylum seekers are in, in this election uh, to some large extent, being criminalized um, and, and characterized as queue jumpers. And you know, so the whole notion of, yes, we support immigration, but we don't support criminals. Uh, yes, we support immigration, but we don't support uh, queue jumpers. That's a really tough question for us <laughs> to answer. How would you suggest that we prepare for that? When did that Tamil boat come, by the way? Uh, nine, uh, two years ago, one year ago. It came a year ago, I think. Yeah. I'm reading the papers, it's, it's like it was yesterday, how it's being manipulated. A year ago. Yeah, you know, we, uh, I, I don't know that I have a lot of positive things to say about it, or helpful things to say about it, because. How, how do we prepare for that tough question is. is well, I'll just to tell you, I mean, the experience in America, I mean, man, there's something about boats showing up that drives governments crazy, <laughs> right? In America, it was Cubans and then Haitians I mean, Guantanamo got its start as a processing facility for Haitians before it, its yeah, current it iteration mm -hmm. because they wanted to take people off U.S. soil in order to process them where they would have abridged rights. Uh, look what's happening with the Tunisians showing up in Italy and the reaction, right? Yeah, so so yeah. there, there is something, and it's that issue because I, I, I think we have to be a bit sensitive to it. I, I understand that people are manipulating and exploiting this for political purposes, and we have to argue for our principles, which is a fair procedure in which life and death decisions are made by competent adjudicators with a chance for appeal because of the stakes. Mm -hmm. We have to stay true to those principles. But I think what we have to also understand is that 
boats arriving on our shores strikes, it, it just activates that fear of disorder, that fear of chaos that drives uh, many in the public and many policymakers crazy. So in America, I have to say, we have not been successful. All the litigation and advocacy strategies, hunger strikes with Randall Robinson, you name it, we still have not come up with a system where boat refugees get a fair process in America. They get an abridged process either on a boat or off, offshore in some way. But quite frankly, we, that has also allowed for our asylum process for those in the country who have I, arguably jumped the queue as well, but uh, are, are, are applying, that that has become more humane um, and more effective, even though when it started out, we were terribly afraid that it wasn't going to work. It doesn't all do so well with some categories of people and so forth. But our asylum system has been preserved in a way that didn't look like it would in the mid-90s. But it had to be separated out from the issue of boats. I, I don't know. I just think that we're in a really tough position. We have to fight like heck, but understand that I think we're up against a lot of resistance Maybe on we boat can refugees. Work with each other then. So final yeah. question. Top three tips on messaging. <laughs> um, speak up. <laughs> Uh, I remember we used to hide behind our desk sometimes when the, the <laughs> backlash was so strong and people would call up and say, you know, do you want to talk about immigration? Like, no. <laughs> uh, so get out from behind your desk is what we tell people. Uh, um, top three messages. Um, it's, a lot of it is, well, I'll prepare, practice, be authentic. Those are the three tips. Lots of times we think that media interviews, um, it's about spin or about uh, you know, being clever or outmatching the journalist or the person asking. And um, for me, uh, talking to the media is a performance art best done authentically. And like good performance artists, they practice and prepare a lot in order to be authentic in the moment. And I don't think we collectively, in, in, as NGOs, those of us who work in NGOs, have kind of put that time in to the kind of preparation and practice. You know, uh, that's why I do a lot of trainings and why I want to do more and more trainings is because we have to get better at winning the debate. We have a tougher argument. They say, us versus them, let's take care of us first. Thems are taking from us. Easy. They say it a hundred different ways, but it's a really easy appeal. And we have to say, we're better than that. It's us and them. It's us and them makes a stronger us. We're for, we're for transcendence and they're for tribalism. That takes practice and preparation and authenticity to be effective. That's what I think. Thank you. Now I'm going to stick to my timeline. We have some questions. Hopefully I can. Oh, this is a lecture. Okay, I'll start with the easy questions first. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Who do journalists listen to? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have pretty high regard for journalists. I see them as professionals. Um, kind, of, kind of like referees who are trying to wade into this debate and figure out what's important and who's important and what's relevant and how to communicate it to their readers. I know that's a generous view of them. Um, but I, I find that when I have that attitude that I'm, uh, I, I, can, I can be more generous with I, I like to think of trying to be generous with them. <laughs> Um, what the real danger I find, is, particularly with American journalists, is what's sometimes called pack journalism or you know, following conventional wisdom. It's, they sort of look at all the other clips, you know, they Google immigration to see who else is being quoted and they talk to the same people. Or they Google how, what's the slant that major papers or publications are taking on this issue and they take that slant. And, um, 
because immigration issues are so volatile that uh, you, we work really hard at encouraging journalists to be a bit, bit more courageous about it. Look at it in a new way. This is changing, and this is how it's changing. And so um, I, I also think that for those of you who, who want to be heard and aren't being heard, it's easier than you think. There's a lot of journalists who want to hear from people who know what they're talking about. And they, um, and, and they want to hear from you. Probably the best thing I ever heard when I was working on this in the, in the early days was, um, you know how if you're working for a, a nonprofit or a non-governmental organization and you want either foundation or government funding, what do you do? Well, you establish a relationship with those people. You tell them what you think and what you know. You find out what they're interested in, and then you try to make a connect, right? It's the same thing with journalists. It's the same thing with journalists. If you're not talking to them, call up the journalist who's covering the issue and say, you know what? Can we have coffee? I'll come by, just 20 minutes of your time, and establish a relationship. What are you covering and why? This is what I'm doing. Is that of interest to you? It opens up a tremendous, it's really a matter of effort. <laughs> For one of the first trainings we did in LA, and we had this progressive media group that was helping us, and uh, this fabulous African-American woman who was leading the training, Emily Tynes, uh, said, OK, why doesn't the LA Times editorial board write editorials that are closer to your views? And this civil rights lawyer raises her hand, who works for Mall Def Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, and says, I know, because they're corporatist interests who are tied to uh, imperial ideology, and they don't care about people of color. <laughs> and Emily looked at her and said, no, you haven't picked up the phone. Point being, and so we did. We picked up the phone that day. We had a meeting with five of us with the LA Times editorial board, started a relationship. Now they call us up and read their editorials to us before they run. Wow, well, that's something. So lots of people will be picking up the phone tomorrow and calling the Globe and Mail <laughs> and the Toronto Star. So here's another very interesting question, maybe particular to the Canadian context. In Canada, as opposed to the United States, um, advocates for immigrant and refu refugee rights tend to be NGOs that are funded by about 95% by government. So when they speak out on advocacy issues, there's an element that, that is perceived to be of self-interest. Right. You know? So you're speaking for yourself in a way. Um, so th what do these organizations do? Gosh, first of all, again, I'm in paradise. The <laughs> idea that you're funded by the government to provide assistance to immigrants. <laughs> Does that happen in a country? Oh my God, not in America. A few states do. A few states do. Mostly what the federal government does is restrict access to services for immigrants. Exception refugees. A little bit of funding for refugees. How interesting. Um, so, so, so the groups that are funded by the government of the United States have a very difficult time speaking out. But what they've done is They've created you know, coalitions or networks that are not funded by government money so that there's more independence and they can speak out. Um, what we've done, those of us, most of us are reliant on foundation money, um, but we have, we have started, like the organization I run has what's called a C3 and a C4 component, which in American tax law means the kind of charitable purposes and the more political purposes. And so we have worked very hard to raise money for our political purposes, which means we can sock both parties in the nose when they do stuff that we don't like. So it's, a lot of it is really trying to cultivate sort of the funding and the independence and being intentional about it so that you can engage in the debate. Now, you know, gosh, I wish our debate in America was as, I don't mean this critically, as nice as it is in Canada, honestly. Uh, you know, in America, it is knock down, drag out, take no, you know, take, take, take no prisoners. So we have to be able to play at that level in order to be competitive. But um, there's a lot of groups, so, so we've had to find ways to get money for enough independence to do that, but it's been hard. So here's another interesting question, and I think I heard you talk about it this morning, but I'd love to get your <coughs> views on this for this audience. What's the role of evidence and hard st statistics in your messaging? 
Um, I, I, I've had an evolution about this. I used to think that if we only presented the facts compellingly, we'd win the argument. Then realized that was terribly naive because there's competing claims on facts. Our opponents have their facts, we have our facts, and they kind of cancel each other out. Then I went through a phase where I thought facts don't matter at all. And now I'm back to thinking facts have their place. Um, Certainly research, look, I mean, raw research just is, is, is absolutely necessary just to know what we're dealing with. But um, we find that facts and evidence work best when it's tied to the narrative that we're putting forward. Let me give you an example. On immigration, on immigration dealing with illegal immigration in the United States, if the, if the frame of the debate is, is there a problem with illegal immigration, we lose that debate. We've tried. They pay taxes, they work hard, they're good people, it's not their fault, there's no line to get into, but 70-30, we lose that debate. Right? If the debate becomes who has the better solution, a comprehensive reform that promises to end illegal immigration and deals practically and humanely with the 11 million here, we win 70-30. Right? So if our facts are trying to prove the other guy's wrong on their frame, the facts don't have any power. But if the facts are, if immigration reform passes, here's how many more tax dollars will be collected, here's how wages will go up, here's how workers will be benefited, here's how families will be reunited, right? And we have a fact-based case, but it's part of a narrative that has power. So we're always looking for how to make the fact-based case that supports our narrative. Now, you have to be careful, as we were talking this morning, about propaganda, right? You gotta, you, your stuff has to be credible, right? You can't just be three pages of, you know, here's three facts cobbled together like that. It's got to be, you know, the referees, i.e. the press and the policymakers, are going to look hard at your methodology and see whether it's credible. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that, that's where if, if, you're, if you're prepared, you know, then, then you're, you're, you know, your narrative can make a lot of sense. So, so, for example, in the bad economy, we had to make the case, why could immigration reform be good for the economy? UCLA study showed that, in fact, it would create $1.5 trillion, no, $1 trillion in economic growth over a decade. Very carefully vetted, best researchers in the country. Boy, that's a fact that we went to town with, right? And then we could back it up. We also did a study, if you deported or expelled 11 million people, what would be the results? And that was a 3.5, a 2.5 trillion drop in economic growth, a 4 trillion swing. And so, I mean, you know, quite frankly, we were winning the economic argument on whether we should do reform. We neutralized the other side's advantage. They would say, these people don't pay taxes. We say reform will lead to $66 billion over the first five years in increased federal revenues. They, were, they wanted us in their frame, we wanted to stay in our frame. There are so many questions I'm having a hard time uh, figuring out which ones to put to you. But this is an interesting one for us as well. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that's my cue. <laughs> we're all looking, oh my god, did I turn off my phone? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, it's gone dead, Judy, thank you. It's gone dead. Someone, okay, sorry. Uh, We've had an increase here um, in anti-Muslim re rhetoric, as have you. How has this new challenge or newer challenge influenced your, your strategies? Yeah. What have you done about it? What tips can you give us? Because we, we face this too. Oh, I think this is such a big challenge in all of our countries. Yeah, and it's not, we're, we're not on the front lines of it. Um, we work uh, closely with the people who are, and I, I think they're doing a great job. Well, let me just, again, this is American political context. One of the things, um, remember I talked about, you know, mobilize the base, persuade the middle, mm -hmm. and define your opponents? One of the most effective strategies has been to define the people who are, in, you know, instigating the Islamophobia in the states. You know, Peter King, this congressman from Long Island, has become the object of tremendous derision in the media, started by the groups that were fighting back, and it's really, um, first of all, he was a big supporter of the IRA. 
And so to be the guy who's saying we have to worry about terrorism, homegrown terrorism, when he was running guns in Northern Ireland, that, that, that was an inconvenient fact for him. Um, and then, you know, it was really, there was just such a hue and cry of mainstream media and mainstream speakers saying, no, we're not going to go there. We're not going to have McCarthyite tactics uh, against um, a, a Muslim community that is overwhelmingly successful, law-abiding, educated, contributing. Um, and, uh, and, and I think, actually, that um, it didn't get nearly the traction. This is just the most recent thing. I don't know. I, I do think that it's a combination of sort of the community standing up and saying no and mobilizing the community. It's not just saying, oh, the Muslim community has to defend itself. No, allies have to step up. And it has to be not just the usual suspects, but some unusual suspects, I think. So here's a pretty targeted question. I think you've addressed this in some ways, but maybe we'll get another story out of you. What has been your greatest success in influencing the media narrative? Hmm. Probably it was just recently um, when it, comprehensive immigration reform stalled in the spring and summer of last year. Uh, there, was a, there, there, there was a smaller measure that was always part of comprehensive immigration reform called the DREAM Act, DREAM being an acronym. That was, but what it would do is allow more than a million young people who are in the United States illegally and give them the ability to go to college, join the military, and work towards citizenship. So it was a legalization program for, if you will, the most sympathetic group of undocumented immigrants. And um, it was very controversial because our, our movement was so frustrated with the lack of movement on all 11 million that when we decided to pivot and say, we have to take up this charge, a lot of people accused us of being sellouts. Uh, don't you care about the 11 million? You know, that kind of stuff. But it was clear that we weren't going to get anywhere on the 11 million, and we had a chance to help a million. And so we threw down early, and these young people were so inspiring. Boy, it just lifted my spirits, lifted the whole movement's spirits in the end. And what it was, it was the first time we had an immigration debate in America in the last 10 years in which we won the argument. And the reason we won the argument was because these young people stood up and embodied the us rather than the them, talked about who they were and are in a way that was so powerful that it, most Republicans who still voted against it were afraid to speak against it. And the people who were were saying, this is amnesty for lawbreakers, this ain't a dream act, this is a nightmare act. You know, they had their sound bites down. But calling these kids who want to serve in the military and put their life on the line for the country that they've been pledging allegiance to since they were five years old and wouldn't know Mexico or Venezuela or Brazil, what it even looks like, because they were too young when they left. And these, you know, they're valedictorians and they're junior ROTC kids and they're, you know, they've scrambled their way, scratched and clawed their way through universities and community colleges and they have degrees and they can't use them. Oh, it was so powerful. And you know, we often talk about you know, the human face of the debate. This was more than the human face. They were the leaders of the effort. They were the subjects, not the objects of the debate. And we had, uh, it was so, such a joy. So we weren't trying to get ourselves on TV. We were trying to get them on TV. My favorite one was Lena. Uh, well, there were a lot of favorites. But Lena was this girl from Texas, from San Antonio, Mexican parents. And she, she, she wanted to join the military. And we say, you know, Lena, can you go on Fox News? She goes, I'd love to. My, my family's really conservative. We love the Republican Party. <laughs> OK, Lena, right this way. <laughs> she goes on Fox News, right? She's in the country illegally. The fact she's on national TV alone is a radical step, because she's exposing herself to being arrested and detained. She's got a fire Pelosi button because Nancy Pelosi was the lead Democrat in the House, and that's what Republicans were wearing before the election. And she goes on Fox News and she says, you know, my parents are conservatives. We love conservative ideology. We look up to Republicans. Why won't they let me serve in the military? 
you know, and one of the bubble heads at Fox was like, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, and we're watching the TV going. <laughs> so um, so we, we, we didn't win. We, we, we won a, a vote in the House. An unexpected, they didn't want to take it, but the, the movement got so strong and the pressure was so intense that, that we won a vote in the House, and then it went to the Senate, and the vote was 55 to 41 in favor of it, but only in the U.S. Senate is that a loss because you need 60 votes. So we were, we were there, uh, and the, but, but this was how beautiful it was. In this gallery of the U.S. Senate, there were about 300 kids all holding hands, watching the vote, right? You could see the members. Oh, and we heard later the talk, the lead sponsor, Senator from Illinois Durbin said, about 10 Republicans came up and said, man, this, you guys are really screwing us with this one. This is hard. But they all party line, they voted against it, except for three. Anyway, um, afterwards the kids came out, and what did they do with all the cameras? Totally authentic. They prayed. They cried, and they gave a press conference that they had learned so much that they were going to keep getting stronger until they won. And they will. They will win. I think they'll probably be the vanguard at some point, and it will crack open what has not been cracked open for a decade. This is a really good question. It's about immigrant voice, sort of following from what you said. Most immigrants are too busy trying to put food on the table and don't necessarily have the time or inclination to get involved in messaging or policy. How do we cultivate leaders in these communities as the authentic voices? Um, I don't think we have to cultivate leaders. There are leaders. Uh, and the question is, how do some of us who have access to the media uh, make it our business to make sure that the leaders get access to the media? Um, you know, we did it with the DREAM Act, and it was, you know, we had a lot of you know, producers that are used to working with us and reporters, no, we want to interview you, no, we want to talk to you, no. no. Here's, who we, here's who's available to talk to, the leaders that are leading this movement. And they did it, and they actually got turned on by it. Um, I remember in, in uh, Arlington, Virginia, where I lived for many years, uh, the Latino community was very disempowered, not important at all, and a pharmacy chain took over a soccer field that was used next to a housing project by Latinos to build a pharmacy, and they got organized. <laughs> and the, town, the county and the drugstore chain couldn't believe the ability of these leaders to organize. And the lead organizer is now the head government official in Arlington County, five years later. He got a taste of politics. He just wanted to preserve his soccer field. He was, head, he was the commissioner of the Salvadoran League. And boy, what a leader. And he's going to someday be you know, a senator or a governor in Virginia. And so that's, that's, it's, it's, it's more about, I think, um, there are leaders that are, are identified and have st stand forward. There's also leaders that you sometimes have to reach out a little bit to. I love, I don't know if Tina's here. Where's Tina? There you are. She has a great project. Natri has a project to lift up migrant voices. This is one we're taking south of the border. We're going to bring you to the States. We're going to try to make it happen because I think it's brilliant. And it's not just Im immigrant and ethnic leaders talking about immigrant issues. Right? As a Latino leader said to me in Washington, we want to talk about Washington Redskins. That's the football team, right? <laughs> That'll be the day, right? So um, we, we have a lot to do, I think, as those with access to reach out and provide access. So you can borrow her, but you can't steal her. OK. <laughs> How closely do you work with policymakers? Much too closely. No. Much too um, closely. Oh. Yeah, it's very frustrating because American politics is, 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 is so, it's so, so much easier to stop things than to do things. And um, it's so hard to have faith in a system that has produced so few breakthroughs, particularly on our issues, but in many areas. You know, we tend to now to, to kind of spend our time working with our champions who are committed and, and working with them closely and backing them up. 
and moving out from there. We don't spend a lot of time with people who don't really care about our issue because there's not that many votes on our issues. Um, and even so, when there are votes, it's the leaders who corral the votes. So we work a lot with Hispanic members of Congress, Hispanic Senator Bob Menendez. Uh, Harry Reid, the, the head Democrat in the Senate, was a guy who was anti-immigrant early in his career. Check this out. Um, had a conversion when he realized he wanted to be Senate Democratic Majority Leader. And then became an authentic leader when he got to know the Hispanic community in Las Vegas, which has just exploded. And it literally saved his political career last November in a remarkable come from behind victory. And again, he, he's, before the election, he said, I support the DREAM Act. We're going to bring it up before the election. And whether I'm elected or not, I'm going to bring it up after the election. And again, everyone predicted that would be the death of him. And it turned out to inspire a community to turn out for him in the most surprising result in the election. And I love that kind of story. So I, we're, we're interested in, I guess, I guess we're spending more time with our champions because those are the, those are the folks that we're going to work with to try to get this done. In the same way that we worked with Ted Kennedy and John McCain. John McCain was a hero of mine. Republican who stood up to, he, he used to stand up all the time and say, you guys are indulging in fantasy if you think you can deal with illegal immigration without dealing with 11 million, 12 million people here. Saw him in the back room with Ted Kennedy. These guys were like better. I was like, oh my God, it's just like those eighth grade civics tests, texts I used to read. You know, these leaders stand up and they stand up to their parties and they lead the way and they get things done. Oh my God, I don't even know who he is anymore. John McCain has had this lurch to the right. You know, in his last campaign, he had a campaign commercial that said, build the danged fence. That was the tagline. So, you know, there, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see how some of these guys can uh, change their views uh, like chameleons for political expediency. Not, a, not, uh, not surprising, but heartbreaking. So we're going to stay with our champs and see what that brings us. So talking about the champs, we've talked a lot about converting the middle. But what about the base, the, the, the left? the advocacy organizations, the grassroots organizations, the, the, the movement of community yeah. leaders. How do you sustain them? Um, it's not my strength. <laughs> but the good news is that we've reorganized our movement where people who are really good at it are leading those efforts. So we, we, we have been known as, the immigration crowd has been known as a circular firing squad. Right? They're more busy fighting each other than pressing the case forward. Um, that changed in the last few years, in part because the tough enforcement policies are ripping families apart. I mean, a thousand families are being ripped apart a week by tough enforcement in the United States. There is literally, I mean, just yesterday in Detroit, two days ago in Detroit, you had the immigration officials circle a charter school looking for undocumented parents. And you had inside the school parents huddling. And thankfully, they knew how to call an advocate who came by, told ICE, here's your policy that you don't mess around with schools. And they went away. And now we've kicked it up. And it's a huge controversy. And somebody's head's going to roll. Right? But that's, what that's what's happening every day. So um, you know, it, it's, it's tough stuff. So that, that, that reality, as I think, is we've matured as a movement. And we now have this vocabulary of it's, it's totally acceptable and necessary to mobilize the base, and it's totally inacceptable to persuade the middle, and that we're on the same team playing different positions. It's tough. You know, it's tough, man. We are really good at shooting each other in the back. Really good at it. But um, I think the seriousness of what we're up against is, is driving our unity, and um, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out how to uh, adopt a both and approach with our movement. Thank you, Frank. It's been wonderful and very uh, instructive listening to you in the morning and today. One of the things one has to conclude, I think, in this audience is when we listen to these stories about the United States and uh, deportations and 12 million illegal migrants, you have to really uh, consider how fortunate we are in this context uh, and how different we are, notwithstanding the fact 
that we have the world's longest border and we share a common language. We really are two different countries and immigration is, is possibly a platform where we express those different values. But notwithstanding, I think, because of the, of the stress that you find yourself under in the United States, uh, you, you use tactics and strategies, including the communication strategies that we must learn and borrow from. And I learned something today, and I'm going to repeat it before closing, that Frank never speaks about immigrants without saying hardworking, tax-paying immigrant family. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting. So thank you, Frank, for those tips. I hope we'll all stay around for a little while. And thank you. Thank you.